Okay, so again, good night, everyone. Wednesday, the 13th of April, get your Bibles, please turn with me to Mark chapter 13. Uh, of course, we know we've been doing uh, what Jesus had to say about the end times, and we are at the book of Mark right now, Mark chapter 13. Tonight, we're going to try to wrap this up, and we're going to also make some concluding remarks about what has happened, what's happening now. As we know, most of you should know by now, this is a very special week in the life of the church, starting from Sunday was Palm Sunday. And we know that traditionally it's believed that this was um, the last week of Jesus's life. Coincidentally, we are actually dealing with a passage that Jesus did share in the last week of his life. So, and it's also, um, I think it's uh, Mark chapter 13, right? So let's see. Um, a couple let's just make a couple notes to remind ourselves in luke so you should be writing if you're taking notes um in luke 21 verse 37 it says now during the day he was teaching in the temple but that evening he would go out and spend the night on the mountain that is called olivet so in this passage we know uh, this last week of jesus's life he spends it in the night in the day teaching in the temple and in the night he spends it sleeping on the Mount of Olives. What an interesting thing to note. Um, so what we will do tonight, we will not read the entire passage. I will just read and as certain things stand out to me, we will just go through those things just to firm them up in our minds because we know that we serve a God who knows the future. We believe he is, and we know that he, he is the God of the past, the present, and the future. He is he was, he is, and he is to come. He knows everything. There's nothing that he doesn't know. There's nothing that takes him by surprise. We serve that God who knows about what's going to happen literally every single second of every single day. He is outside of time and he knows all things. Thousands of years ago, uh, he revealed himself through prophecy in the scriptures and we are seeing some of those things, some of the things that he've said has come to pass and what it is, what an amazing thing it is to know that the God you and I serve is a God who knows the future, who's in charge, who never, has never, will never lose control and his will, like I said, el the enemy is just playing into the plans of God. Tonight, let's pray and then we'll go directly into Mark chapter 13. And Father, we just come before your presence one more time through the blood of your son, Jesus. And I am so thankful tonight, Father, and grateful that we could come before you. We are thankful and grateful that we are alive, that we are in the land of the living. We are thankful and grateful for your presence with us, for your people tonight, each home, each household represented, who will open the word with me, read the word with me. And Father, as we ask you to fill us with your spirit, the word those say, who, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Cause us to become hungry and thirsty for you and for your word that you would fill us up. At the end of tonight, we would indeed feel filled. Lord, we know that you just don't want to give us knowledge for gain and knowledge sake, but you want this to become a part of our mindset. You want it to cause change and positive transformation and give us the mind of Christ. You want this truth to totally and completely transform our minds. And we ask for that tonight. We ask for a spirit transformation to have the mind of Christ. And every time we open this word and read the word as we read it and it reads us, that Father, we would be challenged to do the things that it says we should do. We will be challenged to pray more, to read the word more, to encourage others more, to strengthen the body of Christ, to become disciples of Christ, to learn what discipleship means, and Father, to forever live in great pursuit of you and of your presence. We ask that you would draw us close to you tonight. I pray for anyone tonight who's listening to my voice, who's in a place, a position where they can't even focus because they're facing situations and circumstances. I pray for the peace of God, which passes all understanding to guard their hearts and their minds tonight. You are the God of hope. Father, we know that when we lose hope in man or when people fail us, you never fail. You never fail. And as I commit your people unto you, we commit this time that we would spend in your word. We just thank you that by your spirit, 
lives will be changed, transformed, it will be drawn close to you. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us tonight, that we would hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we know that we wrap up the Gospels tonight and we are in actually, like I said, we're in a unique position because we are in the, the last week of Jesus's life. We know, of course, um, they celebrate Passover, but for us, we, we call it, well, we know there's a whole long story to that, Easter and all of that, but basically this is the last week of Jesus's life. On a day like today, approximately 2,000-ish years ago, Jesus gave this speech to his disciples on the Mount of Olives, right? Some say Tuesday, some say Wednesday. We won't um, split hairs about it, but indeed we know that Jesus, just the last week of his life, this is what one of the, the longest sermons that he gave and he was very clear. I know Jesus knew what he meant and now we have to discover what the Lord is saying to us tonight, amen? So let's go, I'll start reading, right? And of course we know these passages are also called the little apocalypse because of course we speak about end times right jesus speaks about something that's very important to the jewish people their beautiful temple it's, it's told that it took approximately eighteen thousand men years upon years I'll, I'll give you the exact date in a couple of minutes very long time to produce this beautiful structure and I, what I want you to see is, we'll start reading. He says, and as Mark chapter 13, verse one, as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. So when we think about temple, you actually and I would think about one building. But what I want you to think, it was like a, a complex, right? There were different, I'll show you a diagram in a couple of minutes, but basically what I wanted to think about it was, remember we said it was a huge structure. There's someone that said it actually took up one six. It was so huge. Remember, this is a temple mount and they have um, fortified it on its sides. Uh, it's now about 36 acres of land. And um, he has different types of porches, all different i'll give you the different um pieces of this complex so what i want you to imagine it's not one building it's a series of buildings it's a it's called a complex i have a video to show you tonight actually see so um you would be able to see of course these are not live these are people who have reconstructed due to their knowledge and due to all of the history um documents they have found they have put together something that they think the temple may look like so i want you to imagine this grand structure so the disciples say right and jesus answering says see us thou these great buildings there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down and we know that indeed what jesus said did come to pass in AD 70 and we know that it was a, a great tragedy for the Jews, great tragedy for the Jews. And it, it, it just um, added to all the, the, the things that the prophecy coming to pass. Verse three, it says, and as he sat down on the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him, tell us when shall these things be, right? He says now, Jesus answered and said, take heed lest any man deceive you. So verse five says, we know that Jesus specifically says something very interesting. Now, it is indeed uh, a fact that there are many people who have claimed to be Christ, who claims to be Christ, right? It says, see, right? He says, what shut out that no man deceives you? That's NIV. See is from the Greek word blepo. It doesn't mean merely to casually observe. It implies discerning what's going on in the situation that is not obvious. He uses this term five times in this chapter, verse two, verse five, verse nine, verse 23, and verse 33. He tells them to know the grounds and four times he tells them to take God or to take heed. He doesn't say to take heed of the signs of coming or to watch for him. They are more passive observations. He wants listeners to take heed of themselves so that they will not be fooled by false teachers. We know that indeed you can just make a, a basic search on Google to see how many people at this point in time, there are people right now on planet Earth who have claimed and still claim to be Jesus, 
right? I heard a preacher say, until the time of Jesus is uh, coming, no one before, there's no um, records really of people claiming to be the Christ. Only after Jesus coming on earth, now people claim to be the Christ, right? We know that just as God has a plan, the God of this world, Satan, has a plan too. He, he of course, is planning not with all the information. He could never have all the knowledge. He could see, he could send spies. You know, that we all know there are lying spirits. They are um, eavesdropping spirits. There are all sorts of spirits. And they're planning and they're plotting. And they send all sorts of things. But the devil doesn't have all knowledge. God has all knowledge. And he still is playing into the plans of God. Right? So verse 6 says, Many will come in my name claiming I am he. Let's see some people who claim to be Christ, right? So let's see this. Uh, Anne Lee, the founder of the Shakers, said she was Christ incarnate in the female form. Sun Myung Moon of the Unification Church believed he was Jesus. Jim Jones claimed to be Jesus. Buddha and Lenin reincarnated. Marshall Applewhite Charles Manson. David Koresh now. The, the, the very, uh, I don't know if scary is the word to use, but the concerning thing is this, not that it has people out there who are trying to con us and our children and those we love, but there are people out there who are seeking something and somehow they end up in these cults. It says that the Unification Church had, um, they won't show how much, but from 250,000 to 3 million people believing that a man on earth was Jesus, right? Let's see something here. Marshall Applewhite convinced 39 members of the Heaven's Gate cult to kill themselves. How many people remember? I remember when that, that um, standoff took place between um, some people in Texas with David Koresh. 80 people died. And how many people died in Guyana with Jim Jones? 920. So imagine, right? Now nobody here willfully sets out to be deceived. But there indeed are people who not only are charismatic and can make a truth seem like a lie, they have spirits working with them. Remember Jesus said, it's a deceiving spirit that is sent out. So we see now that this spirit is not only fooling people, it's killing people and literally leading people to hell. So the fact that we have access to the truth to see that no man, and this is something we have to, what is the word? really be on the alert and they're aware of right now because of all the spiritual things taking place in the atmosphere. Indeed, there are people who can pretend, right? There are people who little things they can do will impress people and they will get a following, right? But we see here that what may seem like a simple thing as following a person who claims to be Christ can literally and has literally caused people death, Right, he says, verse seven, many verse six, come in mind him, say, I'm Christ and shall deceive many. So, we know indeed that this deceiving spirit is something that we all need to be alert and aware of and pray for our people that we love in our church, in our village, and even in our nation, not to be deceived by this spirit. Because I'm telling you, the world system is not only corrupt, it is encroaching. Encroaching, I'll tell you something, right. Uh, last week, Holly wanted to go uh, outside, at the top of the stairs, outside a particular door. And I told her no. So what do you think she did? She sat at, on the last step, right? And do you know what she started to do? One by one, when she started to inch up the step, up the step, until she readily got to the top of the step, right? Now, the, this encroaching thing is really something. It's a kind of, we love to bend rules. Humans love to, what can I say? Do our own thing. But in this instance, if we don't hold on to the word and we don't understand that the world system is set up to cause us to fall and we fall for the tricks and the lies of the devil, we are in serious trouble. And as we see here, people have lost their lives, right? So Mark 
chapter 13, verse 7. Let's read it together. I want you to read it aloud with me, right? In your home, if you could. Mark 13, 7. And when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. So we know, of course, we know what's going on with Russia and Ukraine right now. It's it's sad. It's very sad to me that no one and no one is able to stop this tra travesty. All right. It's estimated that one in just just the twentieth century, one hundred and twenty three million people have died in the thirty or so wars of the twentieth century. Right. So we know for some reason, God uses tragedy to set the stage for His plans. This author says. We do know that World War II resulted in re reformation of the nation of Israel. Point to note in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, the Antichrist will be identified when he brokers peace between Israel and their enemies. Verse 8, let's read. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquake in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles, for these are the beginning of sorrows. Right, of course, we know beginning of sorrows. Um, in many instances, it really just means begin. If a woman were to go into labor, it's the beginning of the birth pains, right? Nation, the word nation is from the Greek root word ethnos and means a group of people who are associated by some shared characteristic, whether geographical, familial, or tribal. Kingdom, though, is a Greek word. Basilea, and it's more of a formal political meaning. It is a territory and people ruled by a specific leader, particularly by a monarch, right? So we know, and here's the thing, here's something very interesting. Some other uh, versions include pestilence, of course we know, right? So I don't know if you know this, but here's an interesting fact. In 1343, the bubonic plague started to sweep across Europe. Listen to this, over eight years, two thirds of the population of Europe was affected with the plague and half of those died. An incredible total of 25 million people. How much people have died of COVID so far? Nowhere close to that, right? In 1556, 830, 100,000 people died in China via an earthquake in 2004. 230,000 people from Indonesia, Thailand, and Sri Lanka and India died in an earthquake and a resulting tsunami. So if we were to think about the fact that we are thinking, you know, um, Jesus is coming soon because things are happening, worse things have happened. And, and what I want us to see is this. Nothing on earth, we'll read later in the passage, what is coming is like nothing has ever happened on earth bad like that. So I just read some interesting stats. It says here, 25 million people died in a famine in the sixth century, 50 million people from black death in the 14th century and 15 million in China and India in the early 20th century. So we're talking about millions of people who have been afflicted and affected by, by wars, by plagues, by famines, by pestilences, and this is just the beginning. So we know worse is coming yet, right? Verse nine, it says, take heed to yourselves for they shall deliver you up to councils and in the synagogues, you shall be beaten. You shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. Again, we see Jesus says a, a specific word. He says to be on God. And he's, this has already in many senses happened because there are many people, Christians right now, while we thank God, have the freedom to read the Bible, to go to church. There are people, millions of people out there who don't have that privilege, who are persecuted to the max by their governments, by their neighbors, by religious fanatics. And they live in fear of their lives and their livelihood and losing everything just for their claim to serve Christ. Verse 10, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. I don't think we're too far away with the advent of the cell phone. Like I said, that's why I'm asking everyone if you are on social media and you know how to use it and maximize the platform to spread the gospel, amen? Verse 11, he says, 
when you are arrested or brought to trial, was it, when you shall, they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no toe beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate whatever shall be given you an hour, for it is not he, but you shall speak for the Holy Ghost. Verse 12, this is a very scary verse to me. It says, Brother shall betray brother, and the father, the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. This is something to my knowledge. It hasn't been happening on a global scale. So all of these things still remain to happen, right? We know that Jesus' brothers, his family, they did reject him, right? And we know that in some um, instances, there are people who talk about their testimony when they become the first Christian in their home to become saved, how their family reject them, right? And we know that even if you may not have the best relationship with your family or people, rejection hurts, right? Verse 13, he says, and he shall be hated of all men for my sake, but he shall, who shall endure till the end, he shall be saved. Let's go into our Bible study. Pop on, ready. Good. Good. So now, so we, so we see here now, what I wanted to remember is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of course, they're called the synoptic gospels. They all tell accounts, three different people giving the account of their experiences with um, Jesus and, and there's a whole oral tradition and all of that. But this is the last week of Jesus's life, right? So we know Sunday, which was Sunday, God would have been Palm Sunday, Monday, Jesus ang angers the leaders by throwing the Venus out of the temple. Tuesday, he confronts the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. Wednesday, Jesus bribes um, to betray Jesus. Thursday, the last supper, Jesus betrays. Judas betrays Jesus, Peter denies Jesus, Friday, of course, Jesus is crucified, right? So as we are going into this week, what I want us to all remember, it is indeed a precious week. And if you look at Tuesday, remember Matthew chapter 24 is when we, we saw, and 25, those are the eschatological um, passages in the book of Matthew. So we see here, it is indeed a time that this is what we're living, going through tonight. Right, so like Tuesday, Jesus is to Jesus talks about it. So even though um, we are not looking specifically at Passover and the Easter time, it is indeed a, a, a special thing to remember that this week is a special week for the church. And I, I, I hope for those of us who are fasting with us and those who are spending extra time in prayer to be encouraged as you ask God to draw you close to him. He will draw close to you. And really at the end of the season, we all want to come up with a fresh revelation of who Jesus is, amen? Okay, so we see Jerusalem. Do you see that that little, that's the temple there. Do, 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 now you see the city, how big it is. And you see the temple structure is huge, right? And you see a red line. That is where he walks to the Mount of Olives, right? So he goes from the temple. Remember what Luke 21 to 27 says? He goes from the temple. He teaches in the temple in the day and he spends the night at the Mount of Olives. So he's the end of the te teaching. He's, now he has go he's gone back to the Mount of Olives. And this is where our passage picks up. All right? So now let's see something very interesting. This is from um, Dr. John Barnett. And he says, let's read something here. Now, in the book of Mark, Matthew and Luke, or Matthew, Mark and Luke, Matthew, Luke and Mark, anyhow you want to say it, right? The synoptic gospels, we see talk about a false Christ. And there's a comparison made to the first six seals in the book of Revelation. And uh, Dr. Bannett is saying the false Christ are representative of the white horse in Revelation chapter six, verses one and two, uh, war, Right, wars and rumors of wars will be representative or can be likened to the red horse in Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Maybe we could just take a quick read. How does that sound? All right. Uh, famine, verse 7, right? In verse 5 and 6, he says, The third seal I heard the beast say, and I saw a black horse that sat in him, a pair of scales and balances in his hand. So we know, as someone said, we are all hearing the rumblings of the horse, 
right? You know, when something is like, um, when a big truck is coming near to my home or my house begins to rattle, right? I, I told you, and, and for weeks this happened and on the day we had the big earthquake, I said, Hope, what, what kind of truck is this? And then we say, oh no, that is not um, uh, a truck, it's an earthquake. The whole house was shaken, right? 24, nine, he speaks in, in Matthew, he speaks about death with seven, eight. When he opened the fourth seal, he said, come and see and behold a pale horse. Him that sat on him was death and hell followed after him and power was given to them over four parts of the earth to kill with sword. When he speaks about martyrdom, we know we just spoke about it. People will be killed just because, for, not for doing anything wrong, not for committing a crime, not for doing anything except so wanting to serve Jesus and not denying the fact that they are followers of Christ, right? There are some people, through whatever circumstance and situation, may not able, be able to openly share that, but these people will be killed because they refuse to deny Jesus in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 to 11, it speaks about the seal. I saw the altars of them which were slain for the word of God. And we know that if you are slain or if you are killed for Christ, what a, what a horrible way to die. Yet they have been, they, 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 they still have the greatest comfort to know that they are in heaven. With then he says, and they cried, how long? O oh Lord, will not, not judge and avenge our blood. Verse, last one, sign, the sixth seal, verse 12. And then he says, a great earthquake, the sun black. So we know all sorts of things will begin to happen. So what I want you to remember as we go into the book of Revelation that God will show us, a I mean, I don't think we want to be a fresh scared because I don't think anybody wants to be there during, during that time. I'll tell you a story at the end of today so you'll know something that's very important for us to heed jesus's word it is so important i'll say it again for all of us to heed jesus's word man we love to do our own thing we love to break the rules bend the rules make our own rules but we have to realize that jesus we have to heed to his words amen next slide Good. So I'm going to give you some little uh, snippets now. The three Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. And it says the three Gospels contain much of the same material. Matthew and Luke tell all the stories of Mark. Matthew and Luke also share several stories that are not in Mark. In addition, all three books are written as if the authors have personally observed all the events and reporting what they saw at that time, right? Good. So this is just a chat. I am going to attach to it. What I want you to see is uh, someone did the research. And if you see Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and Revelation 6, 7, and 8, you will, and then Revelation 13, 14, you will see the comparison made. So each passage, a likening is made to the book of Revelation. When we go into the book of Revelation, I will come back and show the link between the gospels, what Jesus spoke about the end times, and then what he revealed to John in the book of Revelation. So look out for that PDF, right? So let's go now. So verse one, and I'll just remind us, I want to show you that, that temple, right? As he was going out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, teacher, look, who said to him, look, the teacher, right? The disciple said, teacher, look, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Jesus said to him, do you see this great? Not one stone will left another. Not one will be torn down. Good. Check out this diagram now. So we see here in the middle of the structure, that's the actual temple um, where we see the um, holy place, the altar, the priest courtyard. But if you look on the outside, we see the, the Gentiles courtyard. We see North Gates. We see a royal portico. We see Solomon's portico, the eastern entrance. There's a court for women, right? There's sudden court. So it's a huge structure. Um, chamber of the lepers, right? The chamber of oils, chamber of the Nazarites. There's a woman's courtyard. There's, it's so very funny. There was a, a, something I read. Um, there was, of course, you see the Gentile courtyard, right? They're now owned. There's a particular place the Gentiles could go on to. And there's a sign that says, if you go beyond this place and you are not a Jew, you will be responsible for your own death, right? There's a sign that says that no, right? We, of course, we know for those of us who don't know, 
if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. It doesn't matter what race you are. Once you don't belong to the, the 12 tribes of Israel and you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So you're a Gent All of us are Gentiles, right? So this is the Temple Mount. I want you to see how massive it was, right? It says he started in 2019, 2019 BC and he finished in 86 to 64 and the temple was completely destroyed six to seven years later, right? Good. Now, this diagram is what I wanted to see. You remember I said that there was a retaining wall around the temple mount, right? So that's what, that is what, if you're looking at this diagram here, you see where that red line appears? This is the structure above it. That is how massive that structure was, right? So everything above the red line though, after that in AD 70, that um, siege and the burning of everything, all of that no longer existed. But of course, this piece on the underneath, to some point, um, integrity still does exist. Right. So I would have shown you a couple of pictures a couple of weeks ago where there was just a little pile of rubble, right? And we go. of Jerusalem, right? It says then after his return from the defeat of Chalamar, the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, and went to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. Melchizedek, king of Salem, which we, of course we know is Jerusalem, bought a bread and wine. So that's the first mention of Jerusalem, right? So that if, if we're thinking about it now, the point is though, Jerusalem is the city to look at. Genesis 22, right? God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice there, him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So it is believed that this same parcel of land that David occupies is the same parcel of land that Abraham would have attempted to sacrifice his son, Isaac. So we see the, the great historical significance of that piece of land, right? In 2 Chronicles 3.1, the plot of ground that David purchased with his own money from Arana the Jebusite. Of course, you know, that was the place that the, before David took it over, the Jebusites were the people who um, managed um, Jerusalem. Of course, we know Solomon now, David's son would have come and built his temple on the same ground, right? So let's look at my little diagram. It says the city of David, right? Took from the Jebusites in 1005 BC. It was about 10 acres in size with a population of 2000, right? 
Good. Now, this, what I want you to look at is this um, map. There are the current uh, Jerusalem, there's an old city, right? That's the ancient or the old city. If you look at the wall, it's a, to me, if I were to explain it, how I see it, it's like a, it's like a wall city inside a, in a city. So if you look at the borders of this diagram, these are walls, right? You see gates, it's a Zion gate, Dung gate, Golden gate, Lions gate, Herod's gate, um, the new gate, the Jeppa gate, there's a gate that's closed. What gate do you think that is? So currently Jerusalem is divided. This is like present day today, 2022. It's divided into four quarters. That's the old city, the Muslim quarter, the Christian quarter, the Armenian quarter, and the Jewish quarter, right? Good. It was built by Suleiman the Great in 1535. How many gates around the city? Anybody wants to answer that question for me? Eight gates surround the city. Seven are opened, but one is sealed, right? Now, um, Israel, this is the piece now that we, we understand. Israel views all of Jerusalem, including the old wall city that it captured in 1967. We discussed that as its eternal and indivisible capital. However, the Palestinians want East Jerusalem, where the old city is located. Right, as they seek at it as the capital of a state, they seek to establish the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. So we see here this is part of the conflict. Israel says all of Jerusalem is yes, the Palestinian wants peace of Jerusalem. We know, of course, as we just noted, all of the significant things that have taken place in the whole Jewish history that makes this particular piece of land very historical and important to them. Right, so I just mentioned, right? So this is something, things for us to know. Jerusalem current walls were built upon the order of Suleiman the Magnificent between 1537 and 1541. Basically, they tried to fortify the city. They were, they, if you go through the history and you see how many wars were fought, the, the, this um, Suleiman, really what he did is he placed the walls to fortify the city, right? It basically was to prevent invasions from the local tribes. There are eight gates, right? Somebody guess for me which gate is currently sealed. Good. The enclosed area is called the old city and the modern city now is much larger, but it's important for us to understand the significance, the biblical significance of the old city. One gate, the Zion gate, right? That's an example I wanted to see. It does exist right now, it's the Zion gate. Good. We remind us of geography is really important, right? So we see, if you look at my diagram, this is where the temple is, but around the temple, we see a valley. We see the Himalayan Valley. We see Mount Zion. We see the Mount of Olives. So you see how high the Mount of Olives is compared to the, te the temple ground. So we know Jesus was looking down at the temple, right? Three, of course, Kedron Valley will get so many words, right? So, we saw in, in Mark, Jesus mentioned, this is, I'm showing this picture because when you think of a fig tree, I don't want you to think about um, bananas or silk fig or sikki fig, any of those little trees, you know. Um, somebody gave us a, a, a planting tree. And you know, we put it in the ground, you see nice little, little, you know, little nice banana leaves. That is not what this fig tree is like. Anybody remember the song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed upon a what? Sycamore tree for the savior who wanted to see. This is that tree that we're talking about. This is what a fig tree looks like. And this is what the fig, the fruit looks like. So I don't want you to try to make any comparison. Like It looks like a, me, like a huge mango tree. It's huge, right? So indeed, um, it's something they could climb, and this is the type of fruit it produces. Good. One other um, thing for us to note is that we will meet people in our Christian lives who don't share the same beliefs as us, right? And this is what's important for us to understand. We have to know what we believe, right? So when it comes to interpreting um, the Old Testament, or in, sorry, the Old Testament prophecies, 
and the book of Revelation, these are four views. I know it's very uh, wordy, but trust me, you need to know it because when you come across people who hold different beliefs and values than you, you need to be able to be one, defend your faith, and you need also to understand why you believe what you believe so that when they give their very persuasive arguments, and I'll tell you something, there are some people, I've spoken to some people of different religions and they can be very persuasive, right? But when it comes to me, the back of the wrong tree, right? Good, let's go. So the historic approach sees, right? John's ref. So we, when we're talking about um, the book of Revelation, it says it basically sees John's revelation as identifying movements of the church and reason back as symbols. The idealist now, now this is the piece, right? It views the book through the lens of a great conflict between good and evil throughout the church age rather than predictive the futurist which is what we believe it's basically saying that the majority of the book of revelation will be fulfilled in the future now the preachers these are people who think that everything has already taken place last week i did the, the law of the, um, the double occurrence you know that partially fulfilling the old and now there's a complete fulfillment to take place so when you have friends of other religions ask them what they think of the book of revelation is it something that was historical and just history is it something that is predicted to come is it something that's happened already right is it something that you have to um interpret through good and evil it's an interesting thing to be aware of right so as we end the book of um mark we remind ourselves that jesus in particular answered the question about the end times because he wanted us to be aware of what is coming and to be prepared. Good. So what I want you to, to think about now that's happening in the world is this when we begin to see things getting ramped up you have to look for everything to happen on a global scale so global diseases will get more lethal so wait a minute something worse than covid is going to come global warming will get hotter global water shortages will get worse of course we know that is all tied into famine global food security will get more frequent global conflicts will get bigger and deadlier this will the global hatred for christ will get more and more personal and global tracking will get com more complete right so when we look at and when we judge or when we begin to make predictions as what if they think that now is the end time these are some markers i want you to look at is global diseases getting more lethal global warming global water shortages, global food security, conflicts, hatred, tracking, right? Why is tracking important? It's important because the Antichrist will control everything on planet, including your money. Yeah, of course, we know the whole world is going cashless and that's something I, that is one of the things I didn't think I would have to live. I don't know if we will live in that time where money, we will no longer have cash. And we'll have to go all digital, but only time will tell. We'll see how that goes, right? And the last verse is the verse I just, you know, we know a lot of things Jesus spoke about the coming. He spoke about tribulation and he very clearly laid out a timeline. Of course, we know what's the big thing now with the rapture, right? The rapture of the church. That is big, that is big for us, but we know that not everyone who comes who comes to church who proclaims you know there's a something about outside and there's an inside god sees the heart and he will judge and he will determine who will go he says at the last verse if you forward to me all the way to the end to verse 37 right we'll go from verse 35 watch therefore for you know not when the master of the house cometh or even at the midnight or the cock crowing in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto who? Somebody tell me, who does he say to? He said, what I am saying to you. So he was, of course, having a conversation with the people who were with him on the Mount of Olives, his disciples. Yet he says something very important for us to note. He says, I say 
it to you and i am saying it to all stay at the message bible says stay at your post and keep watch let me tell you a story right two stories a couple of years ago um an emergency took place and i didn't have a car to pick up holly so um she had to come home with the school maxi so uh, i believe school would have finished to my knowledge 12 one so of course i am standing up by the window they are looking for my child you know it's one thing to um be waiting and then another thing to be watching so i don't have a chair there so i'm standing up by the window now one thirty comes two o'clock comes i'm standing there waiting for my child eh? three o'clock comes three thirty comes that means literally two hours after holly was supposed to come holly came eventually she came around almost four o'clock and i was so um so <laughs> holly was so upset when i saw holly she just started to ball down the place right but the, the, the point of it though is when i got when i got when I, holly came home and she came inside i stopped watching right so so word to the wise is sufficient i stopped watching when what i was looking for came now Here's my second story, and I will end with this story tonight. It's almost nine. Um, I, I was here around three to four years ago. I um, I wasn't. I don't know what happened, and I wasn't feeling a hundred percent. And I I um was in the middle of sleep and wake, and in the middle of sleep and wake, I I got up and see you know I, I feel like I'm forgetting something you know. And I say it in my mind, I feel like I'm forgetting something. But you know, you have any middle of sleep and wake and you just maybe sit and you're just going to sleep. So I fall into this deep sleep. Of course, while I fall into this deep sleep, all of the windows in my house are open. And you know what a freak storm is? <laughs> a freak storm takes place and I sleep through everything. And where are some of my windows are, it's literally against the bed right uh, um, in one of the rooms i sleep through everything when i wake up now the room the whole bed the mattress the pillows the whole living room everywhere is like some sort of pipe burst and my house full of water everywhere the mattress completely soaked the the, the pillow every the whole bed the whole room everything is flood and i'll tell you something when i woke up in that split second if i had listened to myself and gotten up and closed those windows i would not have had to deal with no ever i mean imagine a pillow soaking wet i'm telling you like i said it looked like somebody opened my pipe in my house because for hour plus unfortunately the rain fell very hard and all the windows were open so in my not watching i'm being alert flood and disaster came into my own house without me even knowing it. I stopped looking, when I remember my previous story, I stopped looking for Holly when, when she came home. But until she came home, I stood at that window and I watched tonight. If you forget everything else I say, I'll remind you something. Jesus is coming soon, whether you, you believe it or not. I, I can't say that. I know Jesus, he, he can't, he said what he says, his word can never pass him and he cannot lie. So he is coming soon. And he has specifically told us until he comes to watch. The person who is watching, he has not said mothers and fathers to watch or pastors to watch or leaders to watch. He says all. And this is a message that we have to get and proclaim loud and clear to all of those we love. Jesus is coming soon and you need to be ready because I don't have a window to heart. God has a window to the heart and he knows your heart condition. He knows the, the ready heart and he knows the unprepared heart. What is the condition of our heart? And if it is, you know, and you have even the inkling of a doubt that I am not ready, that I am not in a position of watching and waiting because I'll tell you this, there are certain, I mean, at the end of the day, I had real cleanup to do, but all was not lost. The, one of the 
biggest tragedies that could ever happen to someone who grows up in church and who has a knowledge of the word, a knowledge of the Bible, of a knowledge of things, but hasn't experienced heart transformation and the rapture takes place and they remain here on planet Earth. I didn't say we yesterday because I have no intentions of staying here. That will be a huge tragedy. Tonight, it may seem like a simple thing. You know, like I said, there were seasons we could say, I will live forever. I, when I get old and I'll get serious with God, all those things, this is not that season. Brethren, all I know is to heed Jesus's word. I encourage you to make it your business for those that you love, pray them into the kingdom and show them little ways how to be ready. There is new parents, aunties, uncles, grandmas, you cannot be ready for the, the, the children and the, the young ones who are in your home. And once they are of an age of understanding and they understand the difference between right and wrong, God will hold them accountable, right? So tonight we end with the, the great promise. If we watch and we, we obey his word, his word and we take heed to Jesus' word, then he will do what he promised. And he will indeed rescue us from the great rats to come. And until then, we know, and look at here, we see he, Jesus never said he would re rescue us and he would stop the pain, he would stop the suffering, he would stop the wars. He never said anything like that. Look at it, the words very clearly. He said, it's coming. But in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the pain, the, the, the suffering for the church, the suffering for the, the children and the child of God, in the midst of it, he says, to be alert, to stand on guard, and to watch. Tonight, we remind ourselves, and I remind myself, my heart, I have to know what my heart condition is. And if I don't know, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal. There is, hell was not made for humans. But the unfortunate thing is humans will end up in hell. Amen? I love you all so very much. Next week, I want to ask you, read Daniel chapter one. And as we end tonight, we know that Jesus specifically gave them these words because he wanted them to be ready for his coming. He wants you and I to be ready. Do you know when you, or when you thinking about Jesus and his coming, all of a sudden the, the things that might be so urgent don't seem so urgent anymore. It keeps really, this author says, it keeps a light touch on the things of this world. While we like stuff and things around us, we need to be heavenly minded. We also need to understand it's an urgent call to remain alert, right? It also has a purifying effect in our lives in terms of knowing that I can't just live how I want. I'll tell you something. It is much easier to sin than to not sin. It's much easier to do the wrong thing than the right thing. It takes lots of discipline. It takes lots of courage. Just in the natural to do the right thing. We all know we're supposed to get eight to 10 hours of sleep per night. And yet it's much easier to stay up late and watch TV. And the next day, you got to get too much to prop eyes open. Not so. It's much easier to eat anything and everything you want than to say, okay, so this is my calorie limit for this day. I only, I'm only supposed to eat this amount of protein, this amount of carbohydrates, right? Just in the natural, just so in the spiritual, it is much easier to do whatever we want than to please God. But we know that God wants us to spend eternity with him. So every day, think about that and say, Lord, even before, and I want to encourage everybody, especially before you go to bed. Ask the Lord, say, Father, speak my, search my heart. If there's any wicked in me, if anything I said or did today to displease you, forgive me and wash me clean in the blood of your son, Jesus. If you have someone in your house, it's not, the Bible says it's not good for the sun to go down in your rat. Hey, serious, serious stuff here. I am not going to let anybody keep me out of heaven. Yet we know unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, all of these things can keep us out of heaven. And we don't want, nobody is worth you go into heaven for that rapture. Nobody is worth it. Amen.
So let's not fall for the tricks and the traps of the devil and let's heed to Jesus's words. Father, we just come before your presence one more time through the blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you for your word and we thank you for Jesus. You speak in so clearly to your church, to us, to help us understand what you require of us, what you command us to do. Father, we know at times it is so easy to do our own thing and to do what we want. We want to be people who are people who are known for obedience to the word. We want to spend our days, our nights, heeding to the words of Jesus, heeding to the warnings, Jesus, that you proclaim so very clearly in the word in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and Mark chapter 13. And Jesus, we just thank you for sending us these words so that we could be prepared for what is coming. Whatever is coming, we ask that you prepare us. We ask that you would deal with our hearts tonight, Father. You are the one who has the true window to our hearts. Seek, our, seek, help us to seek you and search our hearts. Father, search our hearts tonight, whatever in it that doesn't please you. Father, touch our mouths. Father, you see that the words that we speak hurt others. Help us to restrain our emotions, when we get angry, when we get upset, when we get hurt, help us to respond in ways that you would have us respond. When things happen in our lives, teach us how to respond the way you want us to. When we find ourselves in places that we didn't want to find, when we get news that we didn't want, when we hear things that we wish didn't happen, that we would respond the way you would want us to respond. And for those of us who have continuous struggles with mental and emotional issues and spiritual things, that we thank you that we all have issues in our lives. I pray that by your spirit tonight, you would work in our lives and Father, completely transform us to become the people you want us to be. We know this is a spirit work, so we ask that by your spirit, you would work in us. We ask for change. We ask for transformation. We ask for the power of the Holy Ghost to be manifest in our lives, in our homes, in our bodies, in our jobs, in every single area of our life that you would manifest, Father, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done, that we would be changed, that Lord God, we would literally shine as a bright light so all that come in contact with us would see Jesus and be drawn to Christ. Father, you would destroy the works of darkness that have been formed against your people. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against us in judgment, Father, you shall condemn because it's our heritage as servants of God. Your kingdom come and your will be done. I pray in a special way for the children, Lord, all those who must go out to school next week. You see and you know the parents and their needs. You see and you know the children and their own thoughts about going to school. We just pray for the offspring that you've blessed all of us with. As they go to school, Father, we just pray that you would cover them under the blood of Jesus every day. We pray for divine protection. We pray for those who have needs to, for uniform, for books, for all the things to, for the children to be fully prepared, provide. Your word says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed bag and bread. And Father, if we are in a position where we can help others, help us to help others, that we are blessed to be a blessing to others. In the name of Jesus, I just thank you for carrying those children to school safely. And the only thing following them will be the goodness and mercy of God. Father, even as you lay your hand upon us, lay your hands upon our children. Bless them as they go out and bring them back in safety every day. Provide, protect all that you want to do, do in their lives, Father. We just thank you, Lord, for most of all, working in them that they would serve you for the rest of their life, every day for the rest of their lives, in their own way, that you would draw them to you, that they would all experience complete and total salvation and sanctification and be filled with the Spirit and walking in purpose, loving the things of God and hating the things of the world. And I pray in a special way for the grandparents who have places of influence as well, the aunties, the uncles, no biological parents, but yet have influence on children that they would all impact the next generation for Christ. 
We ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you his peace. Amen. Glory to God. Bye.